Hello and welcome to Connect and Collaborate. I am Alex Hopkins, your on-air producer, and I am really excited to get today's show started. We are talking with Dr. Cheryl Ziegler. She is a child psychotherapist, an international award-winning author of Mommy Burnout, and founder and managing director of Child and Family Therapy Center at Lowry. So uh, you've been in our studios before, but we are having you back. We're gonna talk a little bit more about Mommy Burnout and everything you've got going on. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Wonderful. Thank you. I'm so glad that you're here to talk with us. And um, I think one of the big things that we want to make sure we get to is a little bit of your background and what led you up to opening up your practice and then becoming an author. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a long journey. Um, so I am originally from New York. Um, I knew from a very young age what I wanted to do, that I wanted to be, you know, a helper, that I wanted to work with kids. Um, so I actually came out to Colorado um, almost 20 years ago to do my doctoral program up at UNC in Greeley. And um, I did that for three years. I went back to New York and did my doctoral level internship and then came back. And what, what, what happened to me, how I got this whole journey is kind of all tied together because... When I came back, I was newly married, and then about a year later, we wanted to start a family. And I was also had my dream job, which was to be a clinical director of a residential treatment center for kids. So that's those kinds of kids are highest level of trauma. Um, you know, some are looking to get adopted, foster care. So it's really an intense population. But I've always been in residential treatment, and I loved it. And what happened was we were trying to conceive for a year and it wasn't happening and once in a while people would say you know maybe it's the stress maybe you know and i really rejected that and i still feel like that's a pretty sensitive thing to say to somebody but um certainly i have the wisdom now so i decided probably i should take a break and so what i did was um i qu quit my job as the clinical director and became a consultant and so i was only going it was a commute um but i was only going up to loveland one time um, a week and then we went on vacation and within one month I was pregnant. Wow. Yeah. So I think that was one of the first times that I really saw the connection really directly in my life between stress and something manifesting in your body or the inability to do something. Um, and so, and I'm sure it wasn't the first time that happened, but it was the most obvious. And, um, so what happened was I got pregnant and now I only ha was consulting one day a week and I always knew I wanted to have a private practice. I didn't think it was going to be as early. I was pretty young when I started it. Um, but what I just decided to do was go ahead and just build a private practice right in my neighborhood so we work and live in Lowry, <laughs> um, make life easy. And I just started really early and it's been over a little over 13 years now of having Congrats. that. Yeah, thank you. And very successful and kind of growing. And so um, it's been a great opportunity to see lots of different kinds of clients. So this is how I get to the book. So that's how I got to a private practice. And then what happened in the practice was I had this opportunity to meet with a lot of different families and I would meet with parents first before necessarily seeing their kid, even though they would call for their kid. And what happened was a very clear theme started happening where in most cases it was the mothers would say things like, um, you know, is this it? Like, is this what I've been waiting for my whole life? I don't know that I feel that satisfied with this. Or, you know, I was a professional working woman and I've been at home for a year or two now. And this is really unfulfilling or this is stressful on my marriage. And, oh, maybe I'm the one that needs to be in therapy. And so all of the things that we can all relate to, I just started seeing this pattern. And if you think back to anywhere from 10 to 13 years ago, Blogging wasn't the same. Social media wasn't the same. So these weren't things people were talking about, and I was observing it. So what I decided to do was I wanted, I knew I wanted to write the book around eight years ago, but it takes a long time to write a book. It does. It really does. <laughs> so I just really started keeping notes of <clears throat> more like themes and observations that I had. And um, eventually I went, you know, got an agent, and we talked about it. And my initial working title for the book was – the mo modern day motherhood. And she's like, no, you need to name it. 
like what is modern day motherhood? What, you know, what are you talking about? Huh. So it was, that was the next challenge is what am I going to name this? You yeah. Know? Um, and so I just really did a lot of research on burnout. I really did a lot of research, I think in general around first caregivers. And then if you do enough research on caregivers, meaning like nurses, ER docs, um, <clears throat> actually they say get surgeons, just people in the kind of medical slash helping profession, Burnout has a lot of literature behind it. And then if you look at their criteria for burnout, I thought, oh my gosh, it's right before my eyes. You know, when you're a mother or a parent, you are a chronic caregiver. There is no end to your job. You do experience cynicism sometimes. You do experience the feeling of like, oh, what does it even matter anymore? You know, these kids are going to do whatever they want to anyway. Or, right. You know, you get those feelings. And so I just matched the criteria, translated into motherhood, and really researched burnout to see if I thought that made sense. And I really genuinely do. So it's not just like a catchy term. I actually think mothers are parents and mothers are functioning in burnout, which is chronic stress yeah, that has no end. Yes. Um, I noticed there when you're talking, you, you say mom, but then you say caregiver, you say parent. Um, and there is an emergence. There's been more men staying at home and being stay-at-home dads, right? And yes. so are you seeing the same burnout between men and women? As the, or is that, uh, it's relatively new that we're seeing that. So is that something you have seen before? So this is the really interesting thing. And I do, I will continue to correct myself because I'd say one of the biggest surprises over the last year, it's been almost a year since it published, is that the men have come out loud and strong <laughs> against me, really, you know, and saying, what about the dads? Why aren't you talking about men? Um, and so that's probably been one of the biggest surprises that I've experienced. And so I do try to, and even when um, people host me to do talks at their organizations or schools, they ask me, will you title this parental burnout? You know, and yeah. so school, everybody's being sensitive to the fact, right. you know, and so again, I started writing this five years ago, um, but also I, this is what I'll say. So then I, I did the research because I'm like, well, I actually don't know. I feel like I want to just talk about what I definitely know. And if right. I don't know something, so I did some research and interestingly in Europe, a couple of things, they have something called burnout syndrome in Europe and it's a completely legit reason to uh, miss work. Yeah. So people I think are a little bit more open about their stress and where they are. And another thing is they did track burnout in dads, at least in one study that I was able to find that seems kind of legit. And that men were between 11 and 12% of dads were experiencing burnout and about 13% of women or moms were experiencing burnout. So it was really close. Yeah. So I'm thinking, yes, anecdotally in the States, just from the response, even I did a TEDx talk and a lot of like the men would respond and they're not always nice, but the ones that are decently nice say, <laughs> you know, like, don't forget the men. That's been the big, big message. Yeah. So for the, for the year anniversary, I plan to write an article next month on daddy burnout and you know, what, what I'm seeing there, but definitely in our, my talks and conversations, they add a lot of color and flavor to their experiences. And I do really think they're experiencing a great deal of stress. Absolutely. Well, and I, being a parent is hard. Yes. It just is. Um, I am not one. Uh, I will admit that. Um, but I definitely, you know, I have a niece and a nephew, so I, I get to hang out. And I I have to tell you, sometimes when, when it's very loud and they're screaming and it's pure chaos and, and they're, they're having meltdowns, I'm like, well, see you later. <laughs> I get that choice. Yes. As a parent, you don't get that choice. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And so uh, you mentioned there's criteria for burnout. So is there specific criteria? Obviously for any caregiver and along lines of nurses and ER docs, things like that, um, there's a specific list. But the, you mentioned there's a list for mommy yeah. burnout as well. What's that yeah. list? So um, what I did was, you know, this is all just me translating the best that I can. What I did in chapter one was, you know, kind of introduced the notion of why am I so overwhelmed? So overwhelmed is probably one of the biggest words that I hear. Um, and so each chapter, I love the way it's laid out and I, I get the feedback people do too. It's kind of an easy read, but each chapter starts off with sound familiar, right? And then there's a whole bunch of, there's like a checklist. So you have trouble falling asleep. You lack energy throughout the day. You beat yourself up about parenting decisions. You reach for junk food too often. Um, you wonder if you look forward to your glass of wine a little too much. Um, you're popping painkillers. Um, 
you're getting sick a lot, your immune system's going down, that's stress, little to no interest in sex. And dodging friends' phone calls, that's a big one. Yeah. So in, the, in this day, it's very easy to, like, let's text, right? And in a text, I can put all sorts of emojis and I can put exclamation points and you wouldn't really know how I was feeling. I could hide it. But if you talked on the phone, mm -hmm. then you, you would be able to hear my voice if I was trying to hide something. So um, I say to women, you know, notice, are you dodging live calls or live face-to-face -face -face interactions with people you might be wanting to hide your stress? Um, <clears throat> And then just not, not remembering the last time you took care of yourself, did something for yourself, irritability, yelling at the kids a lot. So I talk about those things. And then, of course, there's the, I think now women relate to kind of the hiding in a closet and crying. Um, and so it's, a, and tired, being physically tired. So if this looks like your life, this book was written for you and you're most likely suffering from mommy burnout. So that's what I did is I really looked at the multiple parts of um, a mom or parent's life and said, if this is you, this book is for you. And, you know, so it goes on. And that, that's how I kind of established the criteria. So in each chapter, there's a, a sounds familiar. And then there's like breakout boxes. And then there's really clear what to do strategies. And I think that's the great part is the what to do is not nothing to do with you don't necessarily have to go to a doctor or even go to therapy. There are things, slight adjustments you can make in your day to make a serious difference in how you handle stress. Absolutely. Well, and I, I imagine everybody relates to one of these or multiples of these at any given time during their life. Um, so the, uh, the amount of that stress and how many times you hide in that closet and cry, I imagine is what starts to add up. Absolutely. So the simplest way to think about what is burnout is it's chronic stress so there's no end in sight, right? So the mom, you know, everybody can have a bad day and cry to, to, to somebody by themselves in a shower. You know, that's another place where women, women typically um, hide and cry. Don't hear about men hiding and crying, I will say that. But once in a while, that's not a big deal. What the issue is, is that those, that list that I just went through are things that I'm hearing about in women. It's day after day and week after week. And one of the biggest criteria for the caregivers is that hope, almost hopelessness. There's no end in sight. You know, so if you work in the ER, you go, it's not going to stop. It's not going to stop having crisis here. Right. We're in an emergency room. Like every day there's going to be emergencies, you know? Yeah. And so it's almost like parenthood where <clears throat> what I've experienced even personally is just when you feel like you've mastered something, boom. They surprise you with something else or another kid all of a sudden has another issue. So yeah. that's what happens with parenting is that just when you get potty training down, then it's the next thing, you know, and then it's right. preschool drop offs. And so it just it always seems like just when you think you've got it figured out, there's a new stressor. And so it's sort of it's not even just 18 years anymore. It's sort of 25 years, you know, of continuously learning and growing alongside your child. Right. And uh, especially when you have that first one. Um, I, so yeah, I guess let's, I'm going to ask that question. It just came to me. Um, one kid versus multiple kids. Does that mommy burnout exacerbate or does that even matter with how many kids you have? Well, it's really interesting. Um, the research that I've come across says the most stressful number of kids is three. Of course I have three kids, <laughs> um, but I can see that. So I think that women who you know, and parents who choose to have one child, a, a lot of them actually, it's a purposeful choice. Now, if they if they cannot have more children, not able to adopt, I think that's a different level of stress they carry around. But if they make the choice to have one child, I've had a lot of people say to me, you know, I knew that that was probably all I could handle. Yeah. And it really is all I can handle. Um, and I think that they probably go through periods of burnout, um, but maybe not as chronically. Um, certainly though, having one kid is a choice. So if you're somebody who chooses and you know, this is my limit, I think I'll be a great mom or dad. If I have one child, they usually do really well, but they still experience stress. They still experience challenges. Like, what do I do about this? And what do I do about that? That's one child. Um, and three is it is difficult for multiple, multiple reasons. Of course, birth order, having a middle child, but the promising thing is if you want four or more, apparently that's less stressful. <laughs> So intriguing. <laughs> yes. But you know, the, with every kid, there's greater financial hardship, right? Right. There's greater, um, probabilities that you can look at the neg, you know, the, the challenges. 
um, greater financial hardship and, you know, a lot more to juggle, a lot more going, going on. However, you know, the sibling piece is something that can offset that though, right? right. Having children close to each other that can play with one another. Um, but a lot of siblings fight a lot and that can be really stressful for parents too. So all I know is that three is the most stressful and that I have not come across anybody who's been like, oh, I only have one child and I never experience, you know, any <laughs> bits of burnout. I think they do definitely experience stress. Yes. Oh, uh, yes. Hands down. Every, I, every, every person has stress. You add a child into that mix that you have to do all of the things for and learn to step away when you're not needed to. That's also another stressor. Once we hit um, puberty and we need our parents less, I'm sure that's much more of a stressor. Just yesterday I was changing your diaper, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> and that's, that is the thing. Um, I think every developmental stage, right? There's, ba there's newborns and babies and toddlers. Each one of those stages has their own challenges. And then there's grade school. And then as soon as, you know, pre even pre-puberty now, the tweens are considered a very stressful and actually kind of lonely time for moms. Um, and so during that stage, you're a little bit less connected, usually to your child's school, to the other parents. And so all of a sudden, sometimes sixth grade comes and a parent feels like, oh my gosh, I don't even know who your friends are anymore because now you're in a middle school and not everybody, you know, parents are sometimes not invited to be in the schools where in elementary schools they want you in there all the time volunteering. Yeah. So it becomes, it can be like a lonely transition. And so you, you do start to lose that piece of connecting with your child. They want autonomy from you. Um, they have other interests. Now they're on computers a lot. So every single stage has a challenge and if you have multiple kids you you might have a teenager a tween and a grade school kid yeah whoo that's a lot of work that's that's parenting almost three different ways absolutely it would have to be i would imagine that that's a whole nother level of consciousness you have to take into consideration um i want to talk about this perfect mom stigma that we have and again i am not a mother but i have lots of friends that are um you know, I have lots of family members that have little ones. And so what I see a lot, particularly on social media, is this, I have to be a perfect mother. And if I'm not, if I don't fit into this mold of what society has of me, whether that's stay at home mom or working mom, and this, not only do we have to fit into this mold, there's a lot of judging that goes on in these circles, yeah. right? The breastfed versus bottle fed. There's so many arguments along the way. Um, so how, how do we combat that? So, I mean, it's such an issue that I wrote an entire chapter on it. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, I titled um, in Mommy Burnout chapter four, how many likes did I get today? The social media mommy trap. So it is so pervasive that until a parent can really stop and really acknowledge what it's doing to us because what I find is parents are very focused on the perfectionism that they see in their own kids, the you know technology addiction that they see in their own kids. And so that's what they want to talk about. How do I get them to be on their phones less? How do I do this? How do I get them to understand that you know Snapchat and Instagram aren't good for them? And so sometimes what I say to parents are, let's talk about your habits first, right? And so it's such a problem. I mean, Pinterest and Facebook, which is usually more of a parent thing, what that does is it shows everybody's highlights and it doesn't show the lowlights. And so what I find is I hear parents say to me, oh, well, isn't it nice that they got to go on that vacation, you know, to Hawaii or their kid is a the state spelling champion or oh, their, their child just got a you know, soccer scholarship. And you start not just comparing your own self, then it's your life, then it's your husband or spouse, then it's your kids, and it goes on and on, it doesn't end. So the notion of like keeping up with the Joneses used to be a neighborly sort of reference. Now you're keeping up with the international Joneses. Yes. Right, it's everybody, it's oh my gosh, why didn't I think of that? Or look at the birthday party. And then there's just the social emotional factor of why wasn't my kid invited to that? Why weren't we as a family invited to that party or the barbecue? Um, everything sort of in your face. So it's, it's incredible. Like I, I definitely talk a lot about the negative impact of social media on kids. We know that it increases depression. It increases anxiety. It even increases suicidal thoughts. Um, and it makes sense. And they say that the worst 
um, social media app for that would be Instagram because Instagram is just images, mm -hmm. right? So if you see images, so, you know, I, I just saw this this morning, I saw um, a group of women who had been had gone away from each other and all of them look like swimsuit models and they're moms my age. So I thought, oh, well, if they can look that way, I mean, they're wearing bikinis. Yeah. Like, I stopped wearing bikinis, but they're wearing bikinis, you know, and then I have to catch myself. You know, it's just because I wrote the book on Mommy Burnout doesn't mean I'm not susceptible to those things. The one thing, though, that reading and researching the book has done for me is remind myself that's a highlight or that's a choice that they make. I don't know what else they give up to, you know, look that way or whatever. Right. I've chosen the last year to dedicate my life to going around and talking about moms family stress. So I haven't had, you know, so th those are the things that go through my head. I rationalize, you right, know, exactly. here's where I've spent my time, but I'm not spending two hours in a gym because I'm spending two hours researching. Right. Yeah. If I, if I can spend 40, 45 minutes, like high five me, you know, right, exactly. And I do, I definitely do my best. I understand the importance of it, but do I look like a swimsuit model? No. Um, but I'm doing something I really love and I'm passionate about. So I can have that perspective and I might like go up and then whoo, it grounds me. But if you're a mom who's lonely, who doesn't talk about these things, you don't understand that you are in a huge community of other women that feel that way, you can feel really crappy about yourself for the rest of the day. Really crappy about your spouse. Really crappy about your vacation, you know? Yeah. And um, it trickles down to our kids. Last chapter of Mommy Burnout is, are my kids burned out too? And when we look at the mental health statistics amongst our children, we should all be frightened. We should all be absolutely frightened and mortified that we have a new category between 10 to 13 of suicides in kids, right? We should all care about the fact that one in five kids are diagnosed with anxiety or depression, that we have millions of children on, you know, antidepressants and other psycho stimulants. I mean, we have got, you know, a real mental health problem mm -hmm. and it didn't come out of nowhere. I think the pressure that we feel in this society and social media contributes to it and the perfect mommy syndrome contributes to it is trickling down to our kids. So that's really what my ultimate dream is, is that we almost start a mommy movement that says no more. And if we won't do it for ourselves, that we'll do it for our kids. Because I find that motivates moms. Yeah. So if I say to them, hey, do these five things and you know, it's all about self-care, they'll say things like, oh, I'm busy. Right? Yeah. Just like I just almost said to you, yeah. right? I'm too busy for that. But if you say, if you do this, it'll help your kids and it'll help you be a better mom. It'll help your kids be healthier. That's mm -hmm. why the subtitle of the book is how to reclaim your life, reclaim your life and raise healthier children in the process because the two really do go hand in hand. Then I can hook them up. Right. Then she'll be like, okay, if it'll help my kids, right. I'm a lot more motivated to try it. Well, and there is a uh, gosh. We're going to have to take a break here in a couple of minutes. And I want to get into this uh, conversation, too, about making sure you take care of yourself. There is something to be said about moms that are overly stressed, but they're not taking care of them, right? And whether that looks that I have to take 10 minutes every morning for myself to say thank you, right? It's a meditation of sorts for me. And if you, as a mom, don't give yourself at least one little something, maybe that is a facial. Maybe that is your hour-long gym class, right? Right. Whatever that is, you need to have that because your kids are going to feel that too if you don't have a release for stress. Yeah, and we model it, right? So right. we all know that the power of our actions is much more powerful than the power of our words. So we are, if we don't model for our kids that friendships are important, that self-care is important, that you know, mommy or daddy being on the phone isn't an invitation for you to just interrupt, right? That I have adult things that I have to do. If we don't model boundaries, then that's what our kids think is perfectly acceptable way to act. Um, and so what I always tell people is that I know that I can't tell every woman to like, go do yoga and meditate, right? Because it is the standard. We know that's helpful. I think everybody's already heard that. So I tried to put in other things that are really helpful, taking brisk walks, getting outside, soaking in sunshine, but most importantly, our friendships. Most importantly is the social connection piece, making sure that you deal with the loneliness and the solitude that can come along with parenthood and that you're connected to other people. And that has been the biggest response. People contacting me about, I've got this idea on how to connect people and build tribes. So building your tribes and your community is incredibly important. Yes. We are going to get more to that in the next segment. 
stay with us here on Connect and Collaborate. I'm Alex Hopkins, your host, and I am with Dr. Cheryl Ziegler. Stay with us. Hello and welcome back to Connect and Collaborate. Once again, I'm Alex Hopkins, your on-air producer, and we have with us Dr. Cheryl Ziegler, author of Mommy Burnout, as well as the founder and managing director at Child and Family Therapy Center at Lowry. Um, and also, I, just a kudos to you, you are an, an international award-winning author. Thank um, you, thank yes. you. So big kudos there. Um, I want to jump right back into where we left off. We were talking about making sure we have a social circle. Um, and and to talk a little bit about, um, as you said, I'm going to steal this from you, the yin and the yang of social media. Yes, we are seeing a lot of, um, you know, burnout from that, add stress to our lives. We have to make sure that we, not only do we look good, we're being healthy constantly. We have the perfect kids. Our homes are spotless, right? Completely, uh, it, it, it's just a myth. That does not exist. Um, nobody is as perfect as they seem. We all put our best foot forward on social media. That being said, we're finding lots of information about other women that are going through this, and we're able to have this conversation, internationally speaking, because of social media, right? Yeah, so there really are two, there's two sides to social media, and I think if, taken with caution and if you understand how to navigate it and what you're doing it can be very connecting right yeah so <clears throat> some of the things that i found out while i was just doing this research is i want to also study generations and so understanding the millennial parent is very important so just to speak to that the millennial parent is more likely to go on social media or just go online let's say they move to a new city and they need a pediatrician or a dentist or whatever they need they're more likely to go online to look for it or simply throw out, hey, you know, do you like your doctor? If so, let me know who they are. Then let's say an older parent who would have, would network to do that, right? They would have, oh, I'm new to the area. Who do, what practice do you like? That kind of thing. So they go out there for information. They go out there for connection. And so we have to honor that that's just something that that is happening and that's okay. That's, the positive use of social media, right? I'm on social media. I like to share articles that I, you know, think are really helpful. And so it gives me a platform to do that. Otherwise, I'd read something and I'd be like, well, unless I talk to you, I wouldn't right. be able to tell you about it, right? So um, there is a positive side to it. It really is almost like doing it responsibly. It really is time. You have to limit your time. That's one of the first things. You've got to say, um, I'm not going to let this spill over into every aspect of my day, right? At the red light, while you're driving the car, um, during the car line, or you're waiting to pick up your kids, and, you know, during sitting in a waiting room. Like, nobody just sits and talks and looks at each other anymore. Everybody's like this on their phone. And so that's a real problem, even at a grocery store, certainly an airport. You know, there is a device in 90 plus percent of people that I see at least, um, and, and pretty much every kid that I see, anytime a parent feels like they need to be occupied or busy or they might have a meltdown. And so those are the, you know, I'm, I'm melding sort of social media and technology together, but those are the kinds of things that are more detrimental, right? You're letting it spill into every aspect of your life. You're working and trying to look at social media at the same time. That's not a good idea. But if you really set times, you know, you have maybe one time in the morning that you check in and maybe once in the afternoon and you really time limit it, you give yourself maybe 10 minutes a time, so that's 20 minutes a day. Um, that's a lot healthier than what at least Americans are doing now, which is on and off all day long. And then it's also compromising sleep, right? So now you're up. You're, you know, not just watching a Netflix, but you're also doing social media. Maybe you're doing, you know, it's like the amount of things we do with technology are truly affecting the quality of our relationships. If you've got a spouse or a partner, you're not talking to them at night if you're too busy on social media or technology. Um, you're also modeling for your kids that it can bleed into every aspect of your life. And it's seriously impacting people's sleep. And so that improve, yes. you know, that doesn't help the quality of our lives. That's something that we see. Um, is a real factor in reducing the quality of your life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and health. health. Exactly. You know. Yes. I, yeah. I also have that issue. I have to make sure that I put my phone on the other side of the room or downstairs so that I'm not on it at night and keeping myself awake, too. Um, I also like this. Uh, you brought up this having a social circle um, that's real, 
right? Yes. Maybe some moms in the neighborhood go for a walk together if they've got the kids the same age. Um, I, I, I think more and more we are starting to um, make sure, stay at home and be, um, we're not as connected physically as we used to be with our neighbors and friends and things like that. Uh, and particularly when you add kids into that mix, it gets harder. It just gets harder to go and hang out and just have brunch. You have to schedule, you know, if you're married, you have to make sure that your spouse can stay there. If you're not married, you have to make sure that you have care for that child. Can you bring your child to this restaurant, right? Is right. Your you're exactly right. And so creating creating community, creating your tribe is right up there with one-on-one -on -one friendships. To me, it's the second healthiest thing you can do. And I'm really happy that there are now, I think in most major cities, and, and I'm sure across smaller towns and suburbs, there are dad groups too. And dads are getting together because there are these stay-at-home dads. Um, and so people are, I think, using technology, interestingly, to create community. So if it's not going to happen naturally, I mean, in a lot of neighborhoods you drive around, you, do, you don't see kids outside. No. How are you going to meet your neighbors? How yeah. are you going to do anything when kids are so overscheduled, you know? Um, and so that adds to kid stress. But so people are using technology and meetup groups and message boards, opportunities to connect and create. And so um, the interesting thing that I came across, and I probably would have written more about it, but we just needed to limit time, is that without religion, without organized um, faith, without, you know, communities that, let's say, by and large, go to church on, let's say, Sundays, the way it used to be a while ago, we have so much less of that. And that has actually had a huge impact on parent connection, community, and satisfaction. And not necessarily because I don't think that I can worship whatever I believe in, but I don't have a place to go where there's going to be maybe 20, 50 other parents in the same situation that I am that go, oh, yeah, this is what I do for colic. This is what I do for this. Right. This is what I, you don't have that anymore. And it used to be that that was a place people congregated. And if there was an illness, like, you know, boom, you people were going to take care of your kids and meals were going to come. Now we use technology to organize those kinds of things if somebody happens to know that you're struggling, let's say, with something. So the decline of religion and faith-based sort of organizations and congregation has left people seeking community. And so what I'm finding is that people are, you know, millennials and post-millennials are, are building and creating communities and really using technology to do it. Awesome. Um, I want to uh, switch gears just a little bit here and talk about stay-at-home moms versus working moms. And this, I believe, will want to be, is one of those time old classics where women tend to push each other on that, right? Right. You're not a good mom if you're not a stay at home mom. You're not fulfilling anything outside of your children if you're not working, right? And and I, we have some, we see some negative things that they say to each other, but can we find a harmony here? One is definitely not better than the other. It's just how you choose to live and what you're you're comfortable with. Absolutely. This was something that I was very interested in. Um, I had not seen myself in my observational stages of those couple of years where I was noticing the moms coming in and really feeling like I wish you all knew each other and you were friends because I think the world would be a better place if you <laughs> just knew the secret, right, that we were all um, you know, struggling and unhappy at times. And so I didn't see a difference between the working moms and stay-at-home moms. So I did the research, and interestingly, a couple of things came up. Of, of the mom groups that are studied, stay-at-home moms are the least happiest moms. Um, and so the working mom might look more outwardly stressed because she's running from a meeting to a play to the here and there and heels or whatever she's doing. Um, or she's, you know, the sole provider for her family. And it's a lot of, that's a lot of pressure and stress, of course. So she might seem that way outwardly, but she feels usually fulfilled. She usually feels, um, you know, like she has a purpose, so that's clear to her. Um, and, you know, some people have said, well, you know, what about not for somebody who's, like, highly educated, you know? Um, but still, a, a job is a job, and it still makes us feel like we have a purpose to get up and get somewhere, and people are relying on us, and you've got coworkers, and, you know, right. so there's a lot of elements. So I don't think it's necessarily socioeconomic status that would 
make one job more fulfilling than the other. And then the stay-at-home moms, the, the real level of unhappiness that I found anecdotally and then also in the research is that sense of purpose. You know, so if, if a woman or a man wakes up every day and they don't feel like they get why cooking and cleaning and running errands and doing chores and running carpools has a real greater good and it's a real purposeful kind of day, then that eats away at our human spirit. So you need to have that. So that's how I work with parents, parents who stay at home. It's you, I know that it can be hard to be cheerful about doing seven loads of wash a week and all of that, but if you think about it as, this is a way I take care of my family and someone has to do it, right? It can be helpful. Um, you know, the cooking, the cleaning, all of that. This is how I make a happy home. This is how I gather my family around a table. Um, you have to kind of make it like, really get on the big, big picture level and say, why is this important? And then by doing that, there's going to be a couple things that you can scratch off because you go, you know, I couldn't think of a reason for that one, though. So then maybe you scratch it off the things that you do or do as often. So um, I would say the mommy wars, as they are generally referred to, there's still a little bit of that, but it's reduced much, much more um, because women have so many options and options makes us feel like, okay, you're a little bit more in control versus, you know, maybe 50 years ago, women did not have the educational and occupational options that they have today. So then it was a lot more drudgery. Right. Um, what about this mom guilt if you are a career mom, right? That is the one thing that inevitably I've come across with my friends that, that are career moms. They feel guilty that they're not home with their kids. And I think that's one of the things that we're seeing and that stay-at-home stay moms are finally getting. They're like, oh, you do feel guilty. It's, I can see why that you would feel guilty. How do we combat that mom guilt? So, you know, that's one of the things that I find to be the hardest. <laughs> um, and it is a working, it's a working parent issue. And it's also, and I'd say a little bit more with moms. A little, that's a gender-oriented thing in general. Um, moms ruminate about things all day. And dads, a lot of times, yeah, they might have had a tough morning with the kids, but they are able to, like, switch gears because they generally are more problem-solving um, and go on with the rest of the day where a mom will sit and think about it throughout the day. And Did I handle that well? And Should I be going? And all of those things they stress about. So some of the things are similar to what I was just saying about working moms versus stay-at-home moms. When I'm trying to work with a mom who experiences a lot of guilt, um, I really say, I sort of ask them the question, like, are you, are you being the mom that you want to be? Not are you doing the things that you think good moms should do, but are you just being? So that means in your presence, in your affection, in your allocation of time. So I think it's really helpful to take things to <clears throat> a bigger level when you've got a, a big looming kind of guilt hanging over you. Not over, oh, yeah, you feel bad. You know, I could give you lots of examples of things that I'll forget, you know, like school pictures or whatever it is. Like, oh, my gosh, I forgot school pictures. We didn't do her hair extra special this morning, you yeah. know, whatever it is. Um, but truly, I'm able to let go so much quicker. The thought will come to my mind, and I might have some pings of like, oh, uh, that I can't believe it feeling. But then I say, but am I being the mom in general that I want to be? And more often than not, the answer is yes. Um, when it's a no, then I allow myself to feel that guilt and I make myself, though, change something. Right. Right? So if I'm so scattered or I'm so stressed that I'm forgetting the basics, lunch, you know, whatever, whatever yeah. it is we feel guilty about, the, the cleats that weren't in the backpack, whatever it is, I know now that that's probably a manifestation of stress because the mom I want to be isn't perfect, but the mom I want to be, like, let's say now I have an, a, a child that's getting older. I don't want to do everything for her anymore. She's 11. The mom I want to be is the mom that teaches her to be able to remember her own cleats. Yeah. That's the mom I want to be, right? Right. Um, and so it just, it's great because it gets me, I take a step back and it allows me the opportunity to say, like, let's say for my six-year-old, that's still my job to remember the cleats. Right. But for my 11-year-old, the mom I want to be says, I reminded her or we have a system that maybe goes through our schedules for the week. You know what I mean? And so because I know I'm going to do something about it, that's what helps me with the guilt. The action plan is what helps me reduce the guilt. 
I like that. And that's got to de-stress a lot of your life too. Um, I, I, you mentioned a little bit that, that we're going to hear more about moms and moms and dads, right? The dad, daddy burnout side of this. Um, I, I'm curious to know if you know anything quite yet on the difference of the way men and women emote. As we talked about, most women are more likely to go in that closet and cry a little bit, and that's how they deal with that stress. Um, are men more yellers? They, they have less guilt, I think. Um, and I, maybe that's a society thing, right, where we just assume the man needs to work, and so maybe he has less guilt going to work. But let's let's talk about the difference between mom and dad when it comes to emoting. Yes. Well, this is another topic I wrote an entire chapter on. <laughs> um, because, you know, it's the marital relationship piece. And I have a great tip for how to deal with this. But um, chapter six, he just doesn't get it. How burnout puts our marriages in jeopardy. Right? And so... This is a classic, again, this is just a classic general setup. There's always going to be an exception, but a woman has stress. She wants to come home and she wants to process it. And I mean process, right? You want to talk about it from all these different angles and then you want to get someone else's thoughts and opinions and then you want to go back to it and circle, circle. And men have a few minutes of tolerance for this, right? (laughs) They don't want to talk about it for an hour. You know, you had to... You had a tough morning with your boss. Well, I have to tell you how that person was feeling and why I said that to them because it was a reaction. That, yeah. Yeah. No, and then I, so-and-so walked by and I mean, I don't even know. Like, yeah, do maybe, they know what's going on? Did they overhear me? Did I say something wrong? Why aren't they talking to me now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's <laughs> women. Men are not like that, right? So when, when you have, you've become a parent, they've become a parent too, and then you come home at the end of busy days. Whatever the busy day means, it's you were home with toddlers or, you know, you're the COO of a company. You come home, you gather back together. Women want to go on and on about things. And men don't have the patience for that. They don't have the attention span for it. In general, they don't emote and process the same way. They're problem solvers. Right. Right. So they say, oh, well, your boss said this. You know, well, why don't you, you know, tonight come up with three things that you're going to do to do. And a woman instantly is turned off by that. Yeah. Shut down. Right. Right? Yeah. And so you feel just shut down. Like, I didn't even tell you the whole story. Right. Well, what else is there to tell me? I didn't tell you how. Right. I didn't tell you about the tone. Right. I didn't tell you he wore his favorite blue tie, so right. he should have been in a good mood. Yeah. <laughs> and so for men, they're baffled by this. Like, but why is what they say to me. Yeah. And so I just say, because women are processors and men are, are problem solvers. Yeah. And there is a happy way to come together. So these are some of the tips that I have in the book. And I also just give to people live when I do talks, they go through this and like, oh my gosh, how do you know exactly what my wife is like? <laughs> and so I'm like, guys, we're, well, we're all very similar. Wife. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we're all very similar. So one of the things I say to the women um, uh, are don't expect your spouse or your partner to be your, your best, your girl best friend. Right. Your girl best friend will sit on that couch with you or sit at a restaurant with you and she'll listen to your boss story for an hour. Yeah. And be totally into it and totally support you and take your side. Yeah. Right. And so don't expect that from your spouse. They don't have it in it. And right now I'm talking about heterosexual relationships, I'm talking about gender stereotypes. Right. Um, so that's one thing. And then for men, I say, I want you to listen about five minutes longer past the discomfort. I'm not interested zone. So as soon as you notice that, that's fine. Look at a clock or mentally think about it. Give it five more minutes past that, right? And then say, I'm really sorry to hear that. Let me know if you want to talk about like what, what you think you should do. So instead of jumping in, so two things, instead of cutting it off when you are done, mm-hmm. go a little bit further. And number two, instead of jumping into solutions, ask permission or just suggest that if they're, because usually a woman, she'll get there where she wants to go right. to solutions. But it's not usually when it's hot and fresh for her. Right. She needs time to process. And so if that's not going to be you for an hour, she's going to do other things. She's going to be thinking about it throughout the night. Maybe the end of the night or the next day, she'll say, well, what do you think I should do? Yeah. She will come to you. So I say that I say to men, trust that your wife or female partner will eventually come to you. She'll want to hear your solutions a lot of the times. She doesn't usually want to hear it in the moment. Right. Just that little tidbit for both 
is a huge deal. Yeah. They're just like, oh my gosh, you're totally right. You know? And then the other thing I say that it goes for men and women is men also have to value their friendships and their guy time. Right. And that's something that while I was in the midst of finishing the book, there was a great article that came out about men and loneliness. And I just thought, we can't take for granted that it's just women that are lonely. Men also get married, have kids, start careers, and they're like, oh, yeah, that's my buddy. And then they look back and they're like, I haven't seen my buddy in six months. Yeah. You know, who do they have to talk to? And so it's, it's, it's not for everybody, but in terms of the majority, it's for the majority of men. They're lonely and they're not connecting and hanging out with friends the same way that women are. So both really need to make it a priority. Yes. Yes, they do. I love that. Um, we have the last few minutes here, so let's talk about where we can find you, uh, find your book. Where can we get a hold of you? Are you going on any tours? Tell me about that. Yeah, so it's been a super fun year. Um, the book can be found anywhere that books are sold, um, online or in independent bookstores, Barnes & Noble, all that good stuff. Um, and yes, I would say about once a month, I've been going to... Um, business groups. The last, I, the last two talks I've done have actually been men only, um, so that's been really fascinating. So yeah. I plan to write um, something about daddy burnout and kind of understand parenting from more of a men's perspective. Right now, that's not necessarily a book that I have planned, but it is at least a good article that I've planned. Um, and. I, of course, have, you know, my, my mindset on what my new project will be, hopefully by the end of the year. But I really, what I, my mission is, I kind of mentioned it to you before, is I want to start a mommy movement, whatever that looks like, whether that's a show. I need, um, you know, to continue on building the platform, you know, to get us all connected because the things that I have thoroughly researched that truly make a difference in our stress levels, in the longevity of our life, in the quality of our life. Um, like I said, I did a TED talk, TEDx talk, and it's titled Why Moms Are Miserable. And you know, that's just a catchy title, but the story is really about, it was starts off with my lack of, what I realized was my lack of female connection that I needed more of, and then how loneliness impacts us, literally our hearts, physically. Um, what it does to, you know, the quality of our lives, the fact that 19 to 23 year olds are lonelier than even our geriatric population today. In 2018, that was a research study. So my mission is to continue to grow a platform of men and women who are interested, not just in being like healthy parents, but raising the next generation of healthy, well-rounded, less pressured children. Right. And so like at the end of the day, the thing that's most important to me in the whole world is being a child advocate. And I found throughout all these years, especially a prior practice, that the best way to do that is to ha grow healthy adults. Right. We can't yeah. grow a new healthy generation that isn't technology addicted, that doesn't have astronomical suicide rates that are just unfathomable, that aren't you know, suffering from anxiety and depression in middle school. We aren't going to change that in our society unless we change the adults. Right. So my ultimate mission is to help the kids, and the way I see it is by doing that with parents. And so that is all I care about really doing for the rest of this year is just really seeing if we, you know, I can just inspire women to, to create community, yeah. to reach out to their friendships, right, to um, relate better in their personal relationships, to manage their own stress, to model all of this for their children so that we stop putting pressure onto them because it's really just the pressure that's seeping out of us and really start to make a shift in the mental health crisis that we have in America today. Yes, and it is a terrible crisis. I'm going to have to have you back on to talk about that. That is a show in and of itself. Dr. Cheryl Ziegler, thank you so much for joining me to talk about mommy burnout and how we can combat this perfect mom stereotype that we've got out there that's unattainable for everyone and uh, how to be better moms and dads. I'm looking forward to hearing your daddy burnout or reading your daddy burnout <laughs> article when it comes out. Um, but again, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's been great talking to you. Wonderful. And thank you for listening today on Connect and Collaborate. Be sure to like and subscribe our YouTube page while you're here. And uh, check out this podcast and more at cobrt.com slash radio dash podcast. Have a wonderful day.